Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. Today is Friday, February 26th. We're on our 47th episode, and this is going to be an exciting and different episode because we're going to do something we've never done before, and that's we're going to judge this pitch party that we've had all February. At the end of each show, we had one pitch, and we've got our judges today. We're going to reveal them in just a minute. Um, but before that, we're going to do the COVID news, COVID Connect, um, and it starts out with... Uh, don't don't freak out, but I was very sad for this news. Uh, I'm going to just do a screen share here. We found out uh, just today that the wonderful site put up by The Atlantic, there it is, the COVID tracking project will come to an end. These folks have gone out there and with support from agent uh, from news agencies like The Atlantic, they did the digging to find out what the numbers were behind uh, the COVID pandemic. I want to read just a little bit off of their statement here because it was interesting. Uh, they said that from its inception, this project was both unlikely and unprecedented. No one expected a volunteer pop-up collective to publish and interpret public health data for the United States for the first year of a global pandemic. As you know, on this show, we found them to be the most data-driven source out there. They were just dumping pure raw data out and then making cool charts of it. We couldn't find that in a lot of other places. I think they're feeling that too. And as they come to the end of this, they said that we began the work out of necessity and plan to do it for a couple of weeks at most, always in the expectation that the federal public health establishment would make our work obsolete. Every few months through the course of the project, we asked ourselves whether it was possible to wind down. Instead, we saw the federal government continue to publish patchy and often ill-defined data while our world famous public health agencies remain sidelined and underfunded, their leadership seemingly inert. From our perspective, wanting data to share with all of you, I think we have to agree because these folks were doing the best job out there. Uh, they went through a full year. This is their punchline, and we're going to let that speak for itself because we have so respected the data that they have put forward. The work itself, compiling, cleaning, standardizing, and making sense of COVID 19 data. From 56 individual states and territories, it's properly the work of federal public health agencies. Well, yes, that's a, that's a true statement. There is a bright side. They do see some good signs that the government is starting to take over. Uh, survey of this data. Release of high quality facility level data about COVID-19 hospitalizations. Uh, community profile reports. CDC vaccine tracker publication of state-level COVID-19 reports, uh, and a number of other things here. So the hope is that the federal government is picking up where things like the COVID tracking project left off. And uh, this from the CDC, they now have a COVID data tracker, which uh, we're going to look into. This is relatively new to us, but we're going to start digging into this. And in the future, when we talk about COVID data, good chance it's going to be coming from this source. But we wanted once again to applaud covidtracking.com uh, and all that they've done because it has been an invaluable data source for us. I want to then go and share uh, the data for this week from covidtracking.com. We'll bring that right up here. Apologize for the delay. There it is. And this week, uh, currently hospitalized in the U.S., now dropped below 60,000. Uh, the new, the uh, metric we always like to share is that there are 924,000 hospital beds in the U.S. When that peak was up above 120,000 of those due to COVID, that was of concern. It is certainly dropping back down in a level almost approaching the two lulls that we saw nationwide in May, June, and September. So good news there. In Michigan, the numbers continue to drop. We are almost back down to the levels that we saw last summer in terms of hospitalizations, already reaching that in terms of cases and almost there in terms of deaths. So generally good news all around. In terms of vaccine distribution, the New York Times has been one of the best sources over the last few months. And we share this each week. The share of the population that's gotten at least one shot, 
This has bumped up about 2.5 percentage marks since last week. That darkest color is now 2.5% higher. It continues to crawl along. Early on, people were throwing a lot of dirt. Oh, my locale's not doing a good job. We shared this graph, which shows that it really has been sort of a straight line adoption on average, plateauing now over the last few weeks. So we seem to be in this one and a half million doses average per day. And uh, who knows if that's where it'll sort of hang for a bit, but that's what the averages look like nationwide. As we come down from where we've been with COVID, uh, we're really looking forward to March 12th. Dr. Ng Pottinger from Columbia is going to be with us again. If you recall back last May, she was with us and helped us as we were trying to understand testing. What is this going to look like? What can we trust? What can we not trust? She really pulled the blinders off on that. And we're having her back on March 12th to try to understand, Dr. Pottinger, what's going on with COVID now? What should we expect in the future? How should we interpret what we've seen over this last year? Join us March 12th for that. And since we're talking about COVID and the fallout from COVID, I want to welcome uh, Stacy Frankovich from MedHealth and TechTown on with us to tell us just a little bit. Hey, Stacy, how's it going? Hey, everybody. It's going good. good How are you doing? You. We're you doing too. well. We've got a slide up here um, of the virtual roundtable that's being held. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. So as um, you know, as we're, we're fighting COVID, we're we're looking at the next looming crisis, and I think it's really going to be. Um, a mental health crisis, and especially with our frontline workers. So um, MedHealth is partnering with Scale Health to um, provide this free event on March 17th. It's a 90-minute event. We're going to have um, Dr. Arash Javanbach, and I think I'm saying his last name correctly. I will practice before the 17th. Um, but he is a psychiatrist and the director of the Stress, Trauma, and Anxiety Research uh, Clinic at Wayne State University. He has been highlighted on multiple news media um, um, venues to talk about his research. And he's going to have a nice conversation with us about what he's learning. And then we're going to bring in a panel, which includes Lisa McLaughlin, who is the co-founder and CEO of Work at Health. Uh, John Henderson from Children's Hospital of Orange County, and Jeremy Fishbach, who is the founder of Happy App, to have a robust discussion on um, what are we going to be seeing and how is burnout going to affect our frontline workers, and how does the intersection with technology um, help to address those needs, and how will we be able to um, use technology to address those needs. So it's a great conversation. Um, we're really looking for individuals who are in um, the frontline health uh, system positions, clinicians, administrators, nurses, and obviously innovators in the space to um, join in. We'll have a great opportunity for Q&A. And again, it's a free event, so I hope you will join us. You can always go to uh, medhealthinnovations.org to learn more and um, always reach out to me with questions as well. Thank you, Stacey. We appreciate that. I'm glad you guys are talking about uh, some of the other things that come downstream. I think that's where the conversation is going these days. We're seeing so many things, uh, both with challenges inside the healthcare systems and then uh, burnout of other types in society. Uh, we're seeing a number of uh, terrible indicators uh, rising, and I think that's where the discussion is starting to go. So oh, applaud wow. you for taking it there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for being with us. And we'll see you on in just a little bit uh, for something a little bit later. Thanks, Gene. Okay, next up, since we're uh, sort of switching things up and talking about local events, I want to welcome Matthew Himes on. Uh, Matthew is the uh, originator of the A2 Biosocial, a really cool event. And Matthew, I remember one that we were at um, downtown Ann Arbor. It was a great time. You've made the transition to online meetings, but we just wanted to say kudos on all that you're doing for trying to bring the community together and wanted to give you a couple minutes here to tell us about the next installment of the A2 Biosocial. Thanks, Gene, really appreciate it. Uh, good to see you again. In fact, when I was putting together uh, these couple of slides here, I noticed that um, Into Being sponsored the March event, which was actually the last live in-person event that we had for the A2 Biosocial. Has it been a whole year? Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's already been a whole year. I was kind of amazed uh, this week when I was sending out some notifications of how long it's been. 
Um, it's been 20 months since we started the event. We started in, in uh, 2019 in September. It grew quickly on the, on the in-person. We were having over 100 people at the Pretzel Bell, like you said, and uh, uh, it was wonderful. Uh, April last year, we switched over to the Sococo platform to kind of still be able to give this um, networking um, uh, aspect. Uh, a lot of us use Zoom on a regular basis as we are now. Um, and, and some of it fits very well for the format uh, for presentations, but really for a networking, it's been difficult to find certain platforms and, and being able to still network and, and meet new people and kind of learn what's going on in the community. Um, Skoko has really allowed us to, to do that, to kind of move within a space. Um, this month, we may be trying out a new platform called Gather. Uh, it looks like a um, kind of the original Nintendo NES game, maybe that you can wander around like Zelda and talk to people and bump into them. So you can have these um, kind of more natural interactions and, and join conversations and kind of grab people and also introduce each other. Um, but we are happy that we've been able to continue it online. We get about uh, 20 to 30 people on a regular basis and continues to grow each month. So um, we wanna maintain the, um, the balance in the community. We've had great partners uh, overall uh, locally and they've continued uh, between uh, Mishbio, uh, Ann Arbor Spark and uh, MI Lead. Um, in order to kind of help uh, fund the event, even though it's virtual, there is still costs associated with it. So we greatly appreciate um, all the help. We haven't had uh, sponsors like we did previously, but I hope to get back to that um, soon just to help promote other organizations like Into Being. And um, uh, I know uh, Andy Raider's uh, part of this uh, talk later of e e uh, EMA Partners. So um, really good to uh, just bring introductions to other organizations. Uh, so the next event is uh, Tuesday, uh, March 9th. Uh, it's from five to seven. So we host this. Uh, it's the second Tuesday of every month. Um, we get a wide variety of uh, participants, uh, which is great. Uh, people from the university, uh, people from you know small businesses, large businesses, uh, people with funding agencies, people looking to start a business, some people just looking for a job. Um, and so discussion anywhere from science to what's your favorite uh, food or cocktail going on during the pandemic and lockdown and, um, you know, all the great things that you want to do after we get through this. So uh, really appreciate uh, time here, Gene, to um, promote and let uh, people uh, know more about the event. Anytime, Matthew. We appreciate you being here and appreciate all you're doing to bring people together. It's all about creating little points of contact. Hey, did you know that so-and-so was doing? Oh, I got to go talk to them. So we love what you're doing. And for the audience, you know, as people have uh, started to catch on, pop in uh, when we're here on MedTech Crossroads. Usually at the end of the show, we've got a space for you to just tell us what's going on. Tell us about that event. There's no pride of ownership there. We want to boost the community. And Matthew, thank you for boosting the community. We appreciate all that you are doing. Thanks, Gene. Really appreciate it. Um, oh, oh, just add. You can yep. go to Mish, uh, Mish Bio handles the registration. So under mishbio.org uh, slash events, you'll see us on the calendar there and register, and then you'll get a link uh, to be able to attend. So there you go. Mishbio.org slash events, A2 Biosocial. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Gene. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to have you. One last thing, uh, by way of announcement, since we're doing announcements somewhere in the middle of the show here, uh, M2Being is seeking an embedded systems developer, microcontroller firmware design and user interface software development and system design. Other things you'd get exposed to, electromechanical systems and regulatory science. We don't silo people here. We want people to get exposed. So if you like a breadth of things and your focus is embedded systems software, we would love to talk to you. Spread the word. Come join the Into Being team. Uh, you can reach us at any of the normal avenues, uh, and you can email info at intobeing.com if you have interest. With that, I want to move on to the part that you have all been waiting for, and I know I've been waiting for it. This week, the $1,000 prize for one of our pitch party participants. And we specifically said it's not a pitch competition. There's a reason for it. And you may remember the week before we announced this, Walt Young was on the show and he said, you know, I don't really like pitch parties because the right people always lose and the wrong people always win. And it's, a, it's almost a thing to itself. And we said, you know, it's a good point, Walt. We can't pick winners and losers. Your ability to win a pitch competition doesn't indicate your success in the market because pitching and running a business don't mean the same things. But we can recognize those limitations and we can still recognize that communication is really, really important. 
and communicating what your value is that you believe you have in the market before you've gotten there, it's a really important step. So these pitch decks and these pitches are still important when you go out to talk to investors and partners and say, this is the vision, this is what we're going for. So we wanted to find a way to boost that, to bring the startups in, let them talk about what they're doing. And we've really split this into two parts. One is a pitch discussion. We're gonna talk about the pitches we've seen in the last few weeks. The second part is a hat tip. We're gonna ask the judges to tip their hat towards uh, each of them, one of the startups involved. And the one with the most votes is gonna win the $1,000. That's not really to say that one is better than the other because these are very hard to judge against each other and they're not narrowed down by verticals. This is just which did you like best, let's have some fun with it. We wanna remind you and ourselves that uh, Fred Smith was the guy who started FedEx and was told that his concept was interesting and well-formed, but in a class to earn better than a C, it would have to be feasible. And that professor is now eating their words. Uh, so keep that in mind as we go through this. This is for fun, for education, and to tell us what we could and maybe should be looking for as we listen to pitches. It's not picking ultimate winners and losers. You can still submit pitches for upcoming months to pitch party at medtechcrossroads.org. We want med tech companies anywhere in the US are eligible to submit and they will pitch at the end of the show for 10 minutes. Pitches need to have problem statement, vision, value proposition, team, milestones, business model, competitors, and an ask or a functionally equivalent area. That's what we're looking for to be able to look at them minimum. So with that, I want to reveal our judges for the pitch party. And I'll ask you to each, uh, as I call your name, to uh, bring your video on and, uh, and then to tell us a little bit about your organization. Uh, so first of, all, first of all, we have Andy Rader, the managing partner of Evergreen M&A Partners. Andy, are you live with us? I'm here, Gene. There he is. Welcome, Andy. Andy is uh, so nuts and bolts. It's easy to when you're an investor to think in these in these big terms and and long things. And I see Andy so nuts and bolts. He works with companies of all sizes, finding them exits. And I've rarely seen anyone in your position, Andy, doing that kind of thing. I wonder if you take just a minute and tell us about Evergreen M&A Partners. Sure, Gene. Uh, yeah, nuts and bolts. That probably describes it pretty well. Uh, I'm uh, one of the founders of EMA Partners. We're a Denver-based, lower middle market boutique investment bank. Um, we also have a, an office in Ann Arbor, uh, which is sort of the connection. That's why I met Gene. Um, and we help uh, small companies, usually in life sciences, um, including uh, med tech. We help them when they've reached an inflection point, sort of sort through their strategic options and then execute down one or more of the pathways. And the options usually are, they range. Most companies, uh, you know, are trying to decide between several different routes, uh, fundraising, you know, a capital raise, um, some sort of uh, strategic partnership, maybe out licensing, either core or non-core IP. And of course, there's always uh, the option of, of selling your company to a larger strategic. And so as a firm, since inception, what we've done is help companies when they've hit one of the developmental stages that companies go through, we've helped them sort of think through whether they can uh, execute on one or more of those pathways. And then we, we execute a project to help them uh, to achieve that. That's what we awesome. do. Well, we've seen you at work and we, uh, we really appreciate it because you guys, you guys fill a niche that really I, I don't see existing uh, in other places. It's very unique and uh, it's not perfectly early stage and it's not this late stage uh, thing. It's just, it's so attentive to what the value is that some acquirer has and, and what they're looking for and uh, really, really commend what you guys do. So thank you for being here, Andy. I'll have you shut your video and audio for just a minute while we welcome Dr. Nikki Kennedy, vascular surgeon and founder of Arbor Hive to the show. Nikki has been a longtime participant here with MedTech Crossroads and we've always enjoyed the collaborations. Nikki, how's it going? Hey, Eugene, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you. I'd love to have you tell uh, the audience a little bit about uh, Arbor Hive and uh, any other things that are on your mind these days so they can get to know you just a little bit better. 
Absolutely. I know Arbor Hive has been welcomed by Into Being and yourself many times, which we always appreciate. Uh, basically, we are a nonprofit network started by myself and some of my fellow physicians. Our basic idea is, as we all know, to try to get the clinical side brought into innovation early so that we can get better care delivery for our patients. We want to make sure that the med tech that's being developed is something useful that doctors, nurses, everyone else wants and is going to be helpful as they take care of patients. We also want to make sure that our small businesses and founders aren't spinning their wheels. We know how frustrating that can be. And if we can give them a boost with some clinical discovery earlier on, we're hoping that everyone benefits. So That's wonderful. And Nikki is one of those people who uh, isn't just a physician. You've got uh, a number of other degrees uh, and it's, it's really neat because I think if there's a person that you want to go talk to and say, hey, I'm a doctor. I don't know if I, I don't know how to approach this whole world of innovation and stuff. And there's all these people out there and they're trying to do all this stuff. Well, Nikki's the doctor who also does those things so she can help uh, orient you in that, in that world of innovation. So we appreciate having you here, Nikki. Thanks, Gene. Next up, I want to welcome Jim Metzger, the president of Keystone Solutions Group. Jim is a longtime member of this uh, community and uh, runs an amazing facility out on the west side of the state. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Gene. Thanks for having me involved with this. This is a great, great, a fun event. Good way to end we, the week. Good way to end the week. We're glad to have you here. And I want to thank you again, Jim, for all that you've done um, over this last year, because uh, you were one of the ones who helped us get the word out to bring this community together in the first place. So the fact that we're here is uh, in thanks to many of the efforts that, uh, that you made early on with us. So thank you. Tell us just a bit about Keystone Solutions Group. Yeah, so Keystone Solutions Group is a turnkey product development and contract manufacturing resource. Our primary market focus, actually it's become just about 100% of our focus is medical device. So we specialize in the development and launch and manufacture and sterilization management of single use devices, that's our biggest footprint. We also do some work in some smaller electromechanical uh, products and devices. As Gene mentioned, we're here in sunny Kalamazoo and our facility is located just off I-94. We're about 60,000 square feet and uh, we have just under 60 employees currently. We have a wide range of capabilities and environments here at the facility. So we have, we just finished the the construction of our fourth class eight clean room. So we have four class eight clean rooms. We have a class five uh, final assembly area for some implants that we work on. And we also have some other controlled environments. So real quick in terms of capabilities, we are experts at sterile barrier packaging, whether that's pouches or formed packages or trays, uh, just a, a numerous wide range of products there. Uh, we talked about COVID a little earlier. We were able to pivot last year and quickly start producing and sterilizing sample collection swabs, which then led to vials, which then led to complete kits. So that's been an interesting ride over the last year for sure. And, uh, you know, we're ISO 1345 certified 2016. We're FDA registered. And uh, we love to work with startups and early stage companies. That's how I built Keystone and uh, love to be part of this event as well. Thank you, Jim, appreciate having you here. And uh, many of our judges here have had uh, different segments uh, that they've done on the show before. Um, Jim had a great one and others have as well. Uh, and so you can find those in the old uh, archives of MedTech Crossroads. If you, if you like what you heard somebody say, go back and look, because chances are you've heard them uh, talk on here before about startups in the startup world. So thanks for being here, Jim. Thank you. I want to welcome Stacy Frankovich, who you just heard from a minute ago. She's the program manager at Med, Med Health at TechTown. And uh, I always uh, remember, Stacy, uh, when I first met you, you impressed me as somebody who, I think the thing that you said when you came to Med Health was, I'm going to go on a listening tour. I'm going to hear what's out there. I'm not just going to sort of like impose my thing. So you are a wonderful person for integrating groups of people and, uh, and bringing them together, which you've done at Med Health now, in addition to your previous roles. Um, tell us just a bit more about MedHealth. Um, you just told us about the uh, upcoming event, but uh, tell us more generally about MedHealth. Sure, and thanks, Gene, for always being such a fantastic partner and um, collaborator with MedHealth. And my listening tour got a little cut short, but uh, it went virtual, so thank you. Um, so just a, a little bit about MedHealth. Um, as Gene mentioned, we are a program at TechTown Detroit. We are a regional collaboration. We work closely um, with Southeast Michigan and Southwest Ontario specifically. Um, and we work with innovators 
through connecting, convening, and educating. And the ultimate goal is to really use innovation and technology to improve the patient experience and outcomes um, by working closely with health systems and providers. So, um, you know, MedHealth, as, as mentioned, are, are pillars, connecting, convening, educating. Well, we do a lot of one-to-one -one connections. We work really hard to make sure that innovative technologies and their founders are finding the right resources at the right time. We are connecting and, and um, educating in a, a multitude of ways through events and um, um, investor type events, investor speed dating, our summit. Um, as you can see, we're, we're convening a group together for um, the upcoming mental health discussion. So just really trying to be um, useful in the space, make sure those connections are being made at the right time, making sure that we understand what the regional assets are and, um, and we're spreading our wings a little bit. Uh, COVID and going virtual has allowed us to create partnerships and collaborations with individuals all across the state, um, throughout Canada and throughout other countries as well and, and other states across the US. So um, if there's any good that's come from COVID is some of the walls and barriers have come down with, with collaboration and opportunity. And hopefully that um, mindset will stay on way past COVID. So thanks for having me, Gene. I'm really excited about this event. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. We're going to see how it goes. It's going to be fun. We love uh, we love trying new things. And today we're doing that. Well, let's get right to it. Let me ask all my judges to come back on here live with me. Uh, we'll keep the share up here so that we can show the uh, the participants. And each of these companies was gracious enough to participate over the last three weeks, pitching for 10 minutes at the end of uh, each show. And uh, in no particular order here, the first one, uh, Valerie Obenchain from AIRS, Advanced Interactive Response Systems, their oxygen flow monitor. Dr. Zhifeng Ke uh, of Eagle View Imaging with their 3D surgical visualization tool. And then Brad Burke from Windsor Gate Assist, the cost-effective traveling seatbelt for, uh, for patients. Uh, we're going to talk just for a minute about guidelines here. and. Um, you know how it is here. We make them up as we go. But some things that we wanted to talk about, the primary goal of this is education, not competition. So we're going to start with a pitch discussion. We're focused on talking about what we liked, what we didn't like, what was missing. We're only going to review the pitch. We're not going to bring the startups on to answer questions. There's a very specific reason for that. We can't pick winners and losers. To say that you won a pitch competition is to say that you're better than the other companies, but they might not even be in the same vertical as you are. So we're just focused on the pitch. What was there? What wasn't there? What was missing? What questions are hanging? The goal of that is so that if you're a startup and you hear one of our judges saying, I really like this, but I didn't hear about this in that pitch, well, chances are that category of thing you might want to think about whether you're communicating that in the limited time that you have to give a pitch. So I encourage you to think about it that way. I do want our judges to make clear, even though you can't ask a question of the startups today, let's make it clear if you were left with a question that was just hanging there. and Like, I can't judge this thing like I want to because they didn't address this. Please make that clear for us. What did the pitches do well? What was lacking? What's what we want to talk about today. After that, we're going to do a hat tip. That is not the criteria of who is most likely to be successful. The criteria is which impressed you the most and, and why, and which one do you want to tip your hat toward. We're going to acknowledge that those hat tips are inherently subjective, but they are final, and the pitch with the most hat tips will receive $1,000 via 1099 from Into Being. Into Being will not participate in the judging. And uh, with that, I would like to... Um, play just a tiny bit of each of the pitches. We're not going to watch the entire pitch, but we're going to play just a bit to give you a flavor for each of those pitches as we uh, then go to our judges to discuss them. So we're going to bring those up right now. Oh, sorry, we just had an issue there. We're going to be sharing the audio here.
walking along. Okay, here's so Brad Burke they sharing the Windsor gate the assist. Wall, they won't suffer any wall-related injuries. Walking, and this pad um, is designed so that it folds up in half underneath so that the handrail can be used. On the right is a stair or bathroom model. We had a hospital come to us and say, we have falls in the bathroom. What can you do for us? So we went to work and we designed a model here that will navigate tight corners in any direction. Just a few words there from Brad Burke from Windsor Gate Assist. Next up, we had, oh, that's a terrible picture right there. We're going to try to ignore that. Just pretend you didn't see that. Complete these are 3D on anatomy. Dr. Zhifan Ke. And we showing us how they can visualize 3D they so would anatomy the error rather than just looking at 2D scans. So how the product looks like. So this uh, light demo of our product, the first case is a brain vascular case. Instead of looking to the images, the doctors can manipulate and look at these 3D objects directly. Another case. That's Dr. Zhifan Ke from Eagle View Imaging. And then lastly, we have when the monitor is vulnerable, the from people that Ayers. are currently wearing oxygen that require supplemental oxygen are kind of the most vulnerable. Those are the ones that we really need to keep safe and protected from COVID. And to monitor their SpO2 is really critical right now. So what we do is on the device, it will display the oxygen flow that the patient's receiving, key data such as SpO2 and heart rate. And that was Valerie Obenchain from AIRS. Well, I want to go to our judges, and I want to go uh, judge by judge. We're going to start with, uh, in the order that they presented, Brad Burke from Windsor Gate Assist. And I'd love to hear from our judges, and, and any of you can volunteer to go first, and then we'll go through each. What did you see that you liked about this presentation or the aspects of it that you thought maybe did bear on the market or the uh, innovation or the feasibility? Any, any positive points? And then as well as, uh, I guess let's go through first for positive points. I wanna hear what did you like about this presentation? And uh, maybe we can start with Andy. Yeah, I, uh, the thing I liked the most was actually the um, market perspective that, that he brought to it. Uh, the challenge with a device like this is, is showing the relevance, right? At you know, EMA, our first question is always, what problem are you solving? And then the next question, of course, is how well you're solving it. And I thought he did a good job laying out the problem itself and then also putting it in, in the perspective of sort of the user base, caregivers, as well as patients, um, and then also a competitive perspective. So I thought, I thought the perspective and context he created was, was really solid. Good, we've got a video problem here, but we'll keep going with Jim Metzger. Yeah, I mirror uh, a lot of what Andy said. I, I really enjoyed that presentation and the, the product, the approach, the cost point as well. Um, when you look at the other solutions that exist out there today and the feasibility of execution and installing the solution. And I, I like the fact that they touched on it. You know, the slide deck itself was well put together. The cadence, the, the content was, was very, very good. And uh, yeah, I like the approach overall. And uh, the, the fact that they touched on the patents and the, the, the market attack, you know, how they're going to attack the market. And uh, yeah, overall, I was I was very impressed with that with that talk. I'm hearing good market sensitivity, kind of from from both of you. You identified that there's a there's an issue out there, and so that's coming through. Which, frankly, that's something we don't often hear in in pitches. It's it's increasingly I think people are paying attention to it, but it's a very important part that we'll often harp on. Let's go to Dr. Kennedy. Uh, well, I'm actually going to agree with what Andy and Jim said, but I'm going to take it from a clinical perspective, even though. Okay. I know that's not always what you want to hear in a business pitch as you and I have chatted about, Gene, but I think when you're talking about medical devices, you have to look at, um, do, is this really going to solve a patient's problem? How significant is that problem? And we all know falls are just a terrible burden and not just in hospitals, but in other places as well. Our physical therapists are short, especially with COVID uh, and having to be that close to patients can really limit their ability to really help and guide a patient. So I really like the clinical use case that they came up with for this. Great, thanks for that. Stacy. what are your thoughts? You see a lot of, a lot of startups. Yeah, um, well, it's easy to go last because I can just say, you know, I concur. But, um, you know, I had a very personal connection to this. Um, several years ago, a neighbor of mine fell in her house and was there, unfortunately, for about nine hours without, without anybody finding her. 
And, you know, so, so something like this really spoke to me. It was, it was a very sad incident. But as far as the pitch went, um, he ticked all the boxes. He, um, Jim, I think you mentioned the cadence was there. The content was there. He knew his market um, inside and out. He was very, very well versed on his market. Um, and I think he knew exactly where, where his beachhead was and where to start. So um, really an impressive pitch, in my opinion. Very cool. Okay, those are those are the good things, and I think what I'm hearing is, is sort of a resounding. Uh, we like the fact that you you were really thinking hard about this market, um, and uh, even an anecdote there of, of having seen this market. I'm sorry to say, happen like in your own backyard. <laughs> Let's go to the to the to the harder part, which is the uh, constructive criticism. Now, we don't want to hold any punches, but. Um, and again, you know, the founder is, is probably listening and saying, oh, I just wish I could answer that question right now. And, and we're not doing that because what we're trying to do is say, did it come through just in the pitch? So that as we're learning about pitches, we can say, you know, that, that's your shot, get it in there. What's missing? Is there anything missing that you feel like I didn't hear this and maybe they know it, but I just, I just didn't hear it. Or maybe you say, oh, they said it, but I, I disagree. Help us out there. Who wants to go first on the on the constructive criticism? Yeah, I, you know what? I'm happy to jump in because there was one little note that I made. Really, overall, I really liked this. But he mentioned um, in one area of the pitch, he talked about his entry point being, you know, the health facilities, the rehab facilities, the nursing homes. And then he mentioned, you know, the home use. And later he, he referred to home use, I believe, as residential. And the only thing that I would say in a future pitch is clarify because residential can be a home health care facility, a residential living facility, or residential can mean private home. And I just think he could clarify that a little bit. Um, and that was really it. That, and, I, and I knew what he meant in the pitch when he said it, but I thought, you know, it's just a, it's a little, little thing that could have been a little bit easier clarified. Great. Yeah, my... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, my main uh, comment, I would say, was around the installation. Okay, so mm. this is actually a physical thing that attaches to a structure. And I, I know there was a cost uh, table there, you know, competitive cost comparison between all the products. My, my question sort of stems to, and it would be great to add this to the pitch. So, and it's also potentially another revenue stream, I believe. So you've got the product, right? There's obvious, there must be a contractor or a service or something to actually mm -hmm. physically install this. It, it doesn't look to be a super trivial uh, operation to get this popped into place, right? And that would be interesting to see as to how that is either an advantage or a, or a disadvantage to the system because it all ties into the financial model, right? As well as service, you know, service could be in there too. That's a great point. I mean, this is, we've all hung pictures in our walls and then we want to hang something a little bit heavier and we go to the drywall anchors and we, you know, punch them through and they fall inside the wall and all that. it's like, yeah, how are we, how are we mounting this? That's a good, that's a good question. I love that. Andy and Nikki, what are your thoughts? So I have a couple of questions that came and uh, I, I think the first one is, I'm not entirely sure what kind of, and this must be, they may be just on the early side, the the safety and efficacy of this wasn't really expressed to me when I listened to this. Uh, I mean, it seems like it would be a great idea, but can a patient operate this seatbelt mechanism independently? Are they sure they're gonna be able to get it? Can they get out of it? If they do slip and fall, uh, can anything happen? And I didn't feel like that was really addressed in this. And those are the horror stories that go through my head. So I'd like to at least have something in the pitch that um, tells me that they thought about this and maybe talk about some of the results from their clinical trials with this. The other question I had had to do with the coverage and reimbursement, which it may be a more um, cost effective solution that's currently out there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have a reimbursable code. It doesn't necessarily mean that payers are going to make it worthwhile. Um, will patients be able to afford this out of pocket? And, and I think those kinds of questions, especially when you're talking about a big installation, because if you wanted to do these on every floor in a hospital or like a, a senior center, um, that's going to get very expensive very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And especially if you're talking about your main market being B2C, you're trying to get into patients' homes. If it's not covered by insurance, this might be out of the price point for a lot of them. Those are great, uh, great comments. Andy, your thoughts? 
Yeah, I agree with Dr. Kennedy, especially on the first point, uh, you know, the, for almost any life science you know, uh, startup or emerging company, uh, the data is important and, you know, you need some sort of use case set or at least sort of, a, I think, a practical walkthrough um, because if it's not really easy to use and foolproof in a lot of ways, it's not going to get adopted. And so overcoming that sort of, you know, answering those questions up front, I think, is important. And then one other thing, you know, one of my worries with a, a system like this is how well protected is it? And, mm -hmm. and even the, the uh, video section you showed us, it was talking about three pending patents, but I wonder about how well they protect the core uh, center of the capability set. Uh, and that's a worry. Uh, now, granted, I have a you know, pretty specific filter, but when I think about the bigger guys in the, the space wanting to adopt it, when I think about how much runtime you can have before a competition emerges, you know, I think about that, that sort of what kind of protection is there. Do you have some sort of moat that goes up? Um, and it may well be there, but it didn't really come through in the presentation for me. Great. Yeah, good distinction. Obviously, we're not uh, giving them the space to, to answer those questions now, but it wasn't in there. And it's a question that came up. So good, good food for thought. Well, let's go on to the uh, next one. I appreciate all of your comments. Uh, let's go on to uh, Eagle View Imaging was next. Um, let's start with the likes again. And uh, maybe we'll keep, keep with you, Andy. What'd you like? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, what's not to like about the platform itself? Anything that that improves decision making going into a procedure uh, and anything that can assist during a procedure is going to be really helpful. And it's going to be helpful sort of all the way through from training surgeons, you know, all the way back to whenever, uh, to, the, to the very start of their surgical rotations, all the way through, you know, actual implementation of facility. So just as a concept, I like it a ton. I mean, there's been a lot of talk for a long time about roboticizing, about image uh, enhancement. Uh, one of their advisors, Dr. Hockey, I, I know uh, well, um, and he's doing his own work in, in enhanced uh, visualization techniques in a different uh, direction. But um, as far as what to like, I mean, for me, just the, the core idea and the concept set is really, really compelling. That's great. Well, things we like. Yeah, I would I would concur with Andy as well. That, that's 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 pretty slick. And the imaging, the power in effective imaging, being able to man, manipulate those images and that information, uh, Dr. Kennedy can uh, attest to that. I'm sure uh, there's a lot of power in that in that system. Mm -hmm. What is I the like clinical perspective? Oh, let's go to Stacy there. Oh no, that's right. I was just going to say I really like that they were narrow on their um, target market. I mean, this mm. application could be could could be used in so many different um, areas, and I liked that they were very very targeted on neurosurgery right now, and um, weren't overextending themselves. Good, Dr. Kennedy. So, what's your what's your thought from a clinical perspective? This is gonna be interesting. Sure. So first of all, this I'm not a neurosurgeon, so I have no actual interest in this but I wish I was because <laughs> this, is, this is a great technology that could really make a difference. So uh, I think that it's a complex technology that um, they've been fooling around with for 20 years with different versions of it. And this really, I think is nailing it here. Um, and it's hard to pack all that into a 10 minute pitch. I thought Dr. Coe did a great job of getting a very specific use case really talking about his market strategy in there where he's including resident training where simulation has become a huge emphasis in addition to clinical care. Uh, so I think he's got a couple of avenues there. Um, he's describing his regulatory pathway, which sounds like it's still pending, but he certainly has a plan for it. Um, he's got a lot of clinical partners. He's starting to get some letters of intent and he's making his future plans. Trying to express what this is, putting it all into perspective as to why it's important and hitting all of these other standard highlights that you need to put into a business pitch in 10 minutes is pretty impressive. So, Very good. Well, let's go to the negatives. What, uh, what was missing here? What, what makes you go, eh, I don't know. So I was a little concerned that they're still waiting on FDA approval. Um, that, that was probably the biggest thing that hopped out for me there because I thought he was pretty clear with everything else. But uh, the other thing I would also be concerned is this is not for every hospital. This is for a big tertiary care center that's doing a lot of these um, 
uh, neuro-oncology cases. So it's going to be a little limited, which is why I thought throwing in resident training and simulation, it, it was a great plus. Nice antidote for that. Yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Kennedy on, on those items. And I would also say that, and it's just probably impossible in a 10 minute pitch. I, I think he did do a great job um, framing it up and, and getting down to a certain level of detail. But for me, it, it just wasn't granular enough. I mean, it's been, it's been the, you know, in, in um, ultrasound and in a lot of, of the imaging space, the whole idea of 3D has become increasingly important. But it's non trivial to, to go from 2D to 3D images, right? And so a little bit about how the platform actually pulls that off, um, I think we, and I, I'm sure it's there. I mean, they, they, they've got it, um, but uh, having that you know, built into the presentation would, would make a big difference for me. Because there, there are a lot of good ideas on enhanced imaging around, um, and it's, it would be relatively easy to differentiate yourself if you can say, hey, we do this one thing that's really truly unique. Mm. So in other words, it's really hard to pack this all into a pitch, but given the crowdedness of the space, if you were in that space and you were evaluating that pitch, you'd want to know where to place it in relation to other technologies. Yeah, and that would help you assess things like the FDA pathway, like Dr. Kennedy's uh, talking about, right? If you can get a sense for, for what they're gonna have to prove to the world, you know, commercially and in terms of regulatory activity, uh, if you had a better sense for for what the what the what the technique was, um, and then the final piece, and I I don't want to go on too long with this, but the final piece for me, um, and I agree with Dr. Kennedy that that you know Henry Ford and the other partners there they're getting in Michigan and, and the rest are great, um, but there's always a huge question with surgeon adoption, right? And so you know attracting KOLs, key opinion leaders, and and you know having papers published around it and having conference activity and the rest. And again, 10 minute pitch, it's unfair to think that you can cover all that in any depth, but those things are just so critical to me because you know, docs are hard to convince to change their behaviors. Um, so um, that's useful last. because the, again, may not be able to fit all in the presentation, but at least know what questions this presentation is raising in people's minds and be ready to be ready to address those. Okay, who do we have left? I think uh, Stacy. Yeah, I don't really have much more to add, to be quite okay. honest. Um, I've seen I've seen his pitch before, and and um, I I've seen it I've seen it grow over the course of time, and he's he, I think he did a great job. Yeah, one thing I would add is, and it's it's not as much about the pitch or, or so forth, but when we've been um, involved with, I wouldn't say this high a tech of a of, of a product line in our company's history. Mm -hmm. What would be good in the pitch and to address to stakeholders, anything like this that is heavily dependent on technology, okay? Technology heavy, software heavy, um, there's always inherent risks and that's because the rate, it, rate of innovation in technologies like this is, is very, very fast paced. So, you know, when you're into an initiative like this, it's, it's, well, it's always key to raise money as quickly as you can, but it's, it, it's key to uh, execute as quickly as you can because you've got to stay at pace with these things. And it'd be interesting to include something in the pitch around that that addresses that pace of change and also how that relates to the competitive systems that are out there. Great, good comments, good mm -hmm. comments. Yeah, because we've seen technology uh, over by the time you get it out there, it can be it can be obsolete. Sometimes there's a market for it, and sometimes there's not. Right. Great point. Well, let's go on. We want to try to get through here if we can before the top of the hour. Let's go through to Airs, um, Valerie Obenchain and Airs, the oxygen flow monitor. Uh, let's start with Stacy. Positives. Um, I think she knew her market very well. I think um, her her understanding of um, the technology and, and obviously being in the field herself. Um, I thought she was conversational in her pitch and um, relaxed, was not um, afraid of any of it at all, understood it very thoroughly. So, you know, I think all in all, um, she, she did a good job. Well, Dr. Kennedy, what are your thoughts? Positives? Sure. I mean, I've I've heard Valerie's pitch in the past and it's been great to see the evolution of it. What I really love is her great understanding of the reimbursement for this. She has CPT codes. She knows what Medicare is going to reimburse for. 
that's huge. It's impossible to, again, to get anything really adopted, especially like this, which is not a commodity item, but we'll say that home oxygen is, um, if you're gonna not be able to compete in that market. So I, I think that having that piece and having the research and the legwork done on that was really a plus. Mm, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I, can I jump in on that? Because I yeah, totally, please. Agree, totally agree with that. Uh, having the, the extra piece of reimbursement is, is incredibly compelling. And I agree, this is the commodity end of the consumption space, you know, patient um, support space. So it, it's, it's, you know, everyone's looking at the nickels. Um, but I would take it a step further too, because it, it, it seems like the platform um, solves patient needs, solves some caregiver needs, and then also even helps uh, in the uh, oxygen supply chain itself, because now all of a sudden you've got a, a feedback loop where patients are getting the right amount of oxygen, and that helps the oxygen companies uh, organize and optimize delivery schedules and, and that kind of thing as well. So to me, it, in terms of back to my very first statement you know, quite a while ago, the, the whole idea of, of what need does it fill, it strikes me that this seems to, to hit several needs, um, mm. maybe, maybe the whole spectrum's needs uh, in, the, in the system. So. I found that to be compelling. Cool. Yeah, I mirror what uh, Andy says as well. You know, Valerie's done her homework. And to Dr. Kennedy's point, you know, it, it's actually, I, the pitches that I've seen, it's rare to see the, the detail in the, in the CPT codes and the billing codes and so forth. And, you know, I, it took me years and years to admit this as an engineer myself, that although we do some really cool engineering and design and development work here at Keystone, that's all that, all that stuff's the simple part. It's who's going to write a check for this thing. How are you going to get that sales channel established? And there's a lot of homework that's been done there. The other thing I like about uh, Valerie's pitch is it's, uh, it does, Andy's touched on this, it takes the holistic approach, I would say, a system level approach to addressing the, the problem, you know, and it's not just you know, it's not just focused on a widget or a valve or a tubing set or what have you. I mean, this is a complete system to address from end to end. It's like an end to end solution for this, for this space. Good, good points. Good points all. Well, let's go to the, to the constructive criticism. Uh, what do you have constructive criticism for Valerie? So it might be that her use case is so obvious that we're not talking about it. But I actually felt that there was a need for a little clarity. Um, and it might be because I'm overthinking it. But as a respiratory therapist, I know that uh, Valerie's seen everything from ICU patients to just somebody's grandmother sitting at home. I'm not quite sure who the target is here. Because if you're talking about somebody who's in an ICU, you have sophisticated ventilator technology already. Is this supposed to be like a step down from that? Or are we really looking at somebody who just wants to make sure that their dad's oxygen tank is working properly from their Bluetooth app at home. Um, there's a B to B, there's a B to C, and then there's like a B to H, a mm. business to hospital. And I, I'm not quite sure which market she's going after. If you just want it to be very simple and clear and very consumer ready, then I, she's got it for sure. It's just that straightforward. But if you want to take advantage of some of the advanced monitoring capabilities that she could potentially put into this system or already has in the system, um, I guess I'd like to see what it can do that would interest me as a ICU physician or a hospital administrator. And that to me wasn't quite as clear just from the pitch. I'm, I'm sure she has this worked out, but um, the, the B to C part was very clear. The B to H part for me, I wasn't quite sure if I saw the value. Great, good comment. Other constructive criticism. I, I'll, I'll mirror that a bit in that, and I'm gonna flip, flip sort of what I said just a minute ago. I do like the idea that this is a holistic approach and a system level approach. I do believe the pitch would benefit from more focus, uh, more targeted uh, launch plan, that type of thing, because it can come off a little bit fragmented. You know, there, there's hardware, there is an app, there's, there's all these things, there's tubing sets and all this. And it, it, that's actually what, in a lot of ways, makes it a business and not just a product in a lot of ways. But in the pitch, I think it has to be a little bit more focused and a little bit more clear as to how that's, that's really executed. I agree with you, Jim, and those were my notes as well. I felt... Um, you know, when you're kind of checking the boxes of a pitch, I felt there were a few things missing. And it was really um, 
defining that that beachhead, that target market, where are we going first? What's our kind of what's our timeline? What's our rollout? Um, what's our financial model? And and I she didn't really have much of an ask. So I know that she was looking for connections, which is great. Um, and all, she said, always looking for funding, but I would have liked to have known more specifically what she was asking, what how much funding she needed, what activities that funding would cover to get her to the next level. Um, so, so that's where I felt that while she knew this product so well and understood this product so well, I didn't know how to help her. You know, so I would like to know more of what she needs and how to help and, and um, a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, Jim and Stacy uh, said what I, I would have said too. At the very least, you know, the, the ask, I need this much money and it is for this very first thing. You know, what's, what's the very, what's the first step you're going to take? And then uh, to Jim's point, kind of, you know, where's it go? Um, what's, the, what's the one year, two year, you know, commercialization rollout? acceptance pathway. Great. Well, good comments all. We've already gotten at least one comment in the chat from one of the uh, from pitches saying thanks for the comments. So this is uh, definitely serving that education purpose. And if you are watching this video afterwards and you're wondering which videos they're talking about, you can find those in the last three weeks in tubing.com slash medtech dash crossroads. You can go back and watch the full pitches there that our judges are talking about now. But now we've come to the to the, to, the, to the nerve rattling part, we're gonna have to pick one of these. And like we said before, I guess two things. One is we are in a relatively small community. People have bumped into projects before the only place where we're going to make any exclusions. And I think we have one to make today uh, for conflict of interest if there's a direct financial um, potential uh, there. Um, and also, we can't really compare these to each other. All we can do is say, really like this one, I'm gonna tip my hat in that direction. So um, I think what we are going to do is um, we are going to, um, Andy uh, had a conflict, uh, I don't know if it's disclosable, but we are going to, I think you said you were gonna delegate a vote to another one of the judges. Yeah, I'm going to uh, proffer my vote, my proxy to Dr. Kennedy. Okay, oh, sounds yes. good. Is there anything, again, I don't want to put you in a, in a position of saying more or less than you want to say. Is there anything more you want to say or advocate, or do you want to just leave it at that? Uh, yeah, so um, it, it's disclosable. Um, uh, we're actually, at EMA, we're actually helping heirs um, execute down, down a pathway. So, um, and you know, it's going very well. So... <laughs> Great. So, Dr. Kennedy, uh, it's up to you. You're going to be able to vote however you want with both your vote and with uh, Andy's vote, if you'll accept that responsibility. Actually, that makes my life so much better. So, thank you, Andy, because <laughs> I, you I was really I was on the fence. Even as I was driving home from the hospital today, I'm like, how am I going to pick one of these? Because it, it it's challenging. They are fantastic. And again, having seen these groups present over the past year or two and have them refine what they're doing, uh, I mean, it's just a fantastic opportunity to get a chance to tip my hat to all of them. Um, I think my my personal hat tip, I'm going to throw towards Eagle View just because it, it, this is a complicated thing to try to describe. And they have not only made, I think, a good use case, but they've also laid out a very strong tr strategic plan to try to get this going. Um, so I, that alone just it's hard to do in space like this. There are a lot of barriers to entry uh, and it takes a lot of work. And I think that Dr. Ko did a wonderful job with his 10 minutes that he had. For Andy, um, I, I actually think that Ayers is also a fantastic one. So I'm gonna throw Andy's vote at Ayers. I hope that's okay with you, Andy. Uh, because again, I think uh, as we talked about, we need to have a little bit more clarity, but uh, she's just hit so many high marks for this. And I think that um, it's this very straightforward device uh, I, I hope that she's successful with it. Uh, and I think that she understands the space so well, she understands the need and she's really trying to hit all of the, the, the players, the supporting team. Um, it's a lot to pack into 10 minutes. It's a lot to pack into 10 minutes. So I hope that as she continues to pitch that all of those rest of those elements come into focus for. 
Great. Well, thank you both for that. Eagle, one vote for Eagle View, one vote for Ayers. We didn't talk about what we we're going to do if we get a tie, and we only have four judges, but that's okay. <laughs> Stacy and Jim, I need you to have your decisions all made. We can't, uh, we can't be changing them here. So I need, I need. Uh, who wants to go first? Make Jim go. Make Jim go first. <laughs> well, I'll be the tiebreaker. <laughs> If you'd like, I can go. This is where I add in a purposeful pause, right? Yes, like, have to sit for dramatic effect. Two seconds, and then I'll tell you who it is. Um, all the pitches were great, really. I mean, it, it's tough. I've been down the fundraising path, and it is not simple. And it's stressful, and it's time-consuming. Um, but uh, all that being said, overall, from my seat, I'm tipping my hat towards Valerie and Ayers. Oh boy. All right. Wow. Okay. Two votes for errors. Right. Stacy, the, the answer is is within you. What what oh which way are we... this is this is harder than I thought. I, I should be doing that. What was my favorite? I just I just want to emphasize we are so pleased to be able to feature all three of these startups to give them a little bit of visibility. They're gonna have these pitches out there available on the web. They're going to have a lot of uh, complimentary statements from you guys. So we're, we're excited to boost the community. And right now we're just tipping our hats towards one of them for a little extra boost. And Stacy, it comes down to you. All the pressure. Wow. Wow. Um, huge fan. I think everybody is working in a great space. I will tell you before I joined today, I had put a little star next to Windsor Gate Assist because mm. I had just that personal experience. And I really thought he ticked all the boxes when he gave his presentation. Um, but I also, you know, such a huge fan of Eagle View Imaging and I've seen his pitches before and I've seen the progression and the growth, it's such a great job. And um, Ayers, you know, definitely a technology that I think is relevant and needed. And, um, but I think I'm going to stick with the, the little star I made on my notes. And I think I'm gonna stick with Windsor Gate Assist. Great. Avoid well, th Avoid thank you, Stacy. Good job, everybody. What a way to work together. So we had uh, one vote for Eagle View, two for Ayers, and one for Windsor Gate Assist. So that means into being, based on your hat tips, we'll be sending a thousand dollar check to Ayers uh, as a little reward for this. And uh, we are so thankful for all of your participation. We're hoping to do it again soon. Can't tell you how much I appreciate each of your. Uh, participation judges. Uh, you did a phenomenal job focusing on the good and the things that you might still have to ask. I'll go around the room really quick for any final comments. Uh, I wish them all. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, Gene, I think that this is um, a really great discussion, very unique in that it's not the competition that most of these others are. And I just want to throw the hat tip to you and the Into Being team. We're coming up with it. Thank you. I'm sure it's a lot of work. Totally agree. I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, it's a really great format, Gene. Really appreciate it. And to all the to all three companies, um, great presentations. Um, it was it was fun to to think it through and talk it through today. So thank you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Absolutely. Great job, Gene. This is this is such a fun opportunity. And um, I appreciate all that you've done. And I appreciate being invited to, to come in and be a part of it. It's, it's been a blast. And to those three companies, they're all going to go somewhere. I have no doubt. They're strong companies. They're strong leaders. Um, and I applaud them all. Absolutely. Thank you, Gene, for all you do with this. This has been a great platform. Well, we want to have some fun with it and boost the community and boost each of you. And thank you to all our judges. Thank you to the audience today. Since we're past the top of the hour, we're going to uh, cut it here. We Our normal procedure is to take uh, questions and comments at the end, but we'll resume that next week. So thank you all for being here, and we'll see you next time on MedTech Crossroads. Bye-bye. See ya.